Father God, we thank you for this season where we remember together the sending of your son, Jesus. We remember his coming. And would you speak to us now as we reflect together? Uh, we want to hear from you, from your word, from your Holy Spirit, uh, words that would challenge and encourage us. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We've been in a series actually for a few weeks now called Grace Appeared from Titus chapter 2 and Titus chapter 3. These are two books in the New Testament in the Bible. And today I want to remember together that of course God's grace has a name, a very specific name. In fact, several names uh, in a prophecy that was made some 700 years before Jesus was born. God's grace is given four. Four very significant names, names that help us understand who Jesus is and why Jesus came. The prophet Isaiah said this, he said, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And I thought this would be a good moment as we gather here to reflect on these names. So let's think about the first one, Wonderful Counselor. You know, when I hear that name, I have to admit, at first I have kind of some mixed uh, reactions to that. Uh, because, as we all know, uh, there are people who give counsel who are good counselors, and there are people who give counsel who's, who uh, give counsel who aren't so good. And, and I know that sometimes counsel is given that's ineffective or lacks judgment or lacks wisdom or seems to miss the point altogether or lacks the power that we need to really help us. But what Isaiah says is that one is coming who is going to be a fully, truly wonderful counselor. And what he says will be true. And what he says will have power. And what he says will be impactful. And therefore, too, sometimes painful. Because that's the way truth works. It can be painful. But what he counsels, this wonderful counselor, can be also life-changing to us if we listen if we put what he says into practice. His counsel will help us become more self-aware, more honest, more forgiving, more loving, more of the servant to others that we ought to be. His counsel changes people. It changes perspectives. It changes values. It changes spiritual orientations, and it changes people's hearts. It changes how they work. It even changes why they work. It changes how they do their marriages. It changes how they parent their children. It changes how they look at other people and how they serve and how they give and how they love others, even those who are difficult to love. And interestingly, this counselor makes his wisdom available, not just to presidents, not just to kings, not just to potentates, but to every rank and file human being who is humble enough to ask him for his wisdom. That wisdom is available to you and me. And I've got to tell you, I really do believe this. This is what all of us not only need, but deeply desire in the innermost places of our hearts, our lives. I believe this counsel, Jesus' counsel, his wise counsel is what is needed to rightly understand ourselves and to grasp the glorious purpose for which we were made. Wise counsel is what we need to navigate the many varied opinions about what is good and what is bad, what is right, what is wrong, what is uh, best in terms of loving our neighbor or loving our spouse or raising our children or trying to serve one another. And I know for a fact that I need wise counsel in areas like this. When facing critical decisions about finances or job, career, uh, a relationship that's struggling or a parenting a child that seems to be losing their way or how to process health concerns. We feel the stress, don't we, of not knowing what to do, not being able to handle it the way we'd like. And Isaiah tells us that we seek the wise counsel of this wonderful counselor and that when we do and when we receive it, we need to listen to that counsel and we need to obey it. I love what the psalmist says. He understands the importance of wise counsel. Uh, he, he tells us uh, the importance of following it as well. He says, I run in the path of your commands, for you have set my heart free. 
That's what listening to Jesus' counsel does. It sets our hearts free. A little later in that same Psalm, Psalm 119, he says, Great peace have they who love your law, your counsel, and nothing can make them stumble. When our lives are built on Jesus' counsel, our lives have gravitas, they have weight, they have stability. Jesus said this one time to a group listening to him. He said, therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. One of the reasons Jesus came to earth was to give us wisdom and to give us teaching and to give us counsel, counsel that we could, quite frankly, build our lives upon. Now, Isaiah doesn't stop there. He gives Jesus, this one who comes, another name. He gives him the name Mighty God. And of course, if you think about it, this is truly, truly remarkable. This name would have been very controversial to Isaiah's listeners. To say someone is coming who's going to be a wonderful counselor, well, that's great. Wise counsel is always needed, isn't it? That's good news. But, but that name in and of itself would not necessarily turn any heads. But to call the one who would come, this would be the Messiah, the anointed one, to call this one mighty God, that would raise some eyebrows. That would get people's attention. If from the time of Isaiah's prophecy, we run the clock ahead about 700 years on the evening that Jesus was born, we are told that angels announced the birth of Jesus and they declared that the Messiah had in fact come, had been born. And in Luke chapter two, they say, today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ, Messiah, the Lord. They tell us too that his name will be Emmanuel, which of course, as you know, means God with us. Angels tell us that this baby who's born will be called Jesus because he will actually save his people from their sins. And this all points to Jesus' true identity, that he is in fact God, mighty God. And then when you run the clock forward about 30 more years from the time of Jesus' birth, what was it that finally got Jesus killed? It wasn't his healing ministry, wasn't even his teaching ministry or the miracles that he performed. It was his claim, this claim right here to be God. At Jesus' trial in Matthew 26, we read this. It says, the high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the son of God. And Jesus replied, yes. Yes, it is as you say. And when he said that, the place went kind of nuts. The high priest, we're told, tore his clothing. The other Pharisees and priests who were there started howling. And shortly after that, the beating started and then the crucifixion followed. And I don't know, I don't want to go down this rabbit trail too far, but I think you all probably know that people like Muhammad or people like Confucius or people like Buddha never made any claim whatsoever to be divine, to be God himself. But without any sense of pride, or without any sense of self-delusion, Jesus would say, the Father and I are one. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And then he would do all kinds of incredible miracles uh, that authenticated this incredible claim that he made. And when he died, he didn't stay dead. That's another holiday. And that served to authenticate his claims as well. So I would just say, make no mistake about it. Isaiah prophesied that he would be mighty God. And Jesus said, yes, that is exactly who I am. And his life and his ministry and his death and his resurrection proved, friends, proved that he was telling the truth. And every single person listening to my voice right now has to figure out if you think that he was and is mighty God. And if he was, and if he is, then he should be mighty God in your life. And this is the central issue of the Christian faith. This is the crux, if you will, of Jesus' teaching. This is the thing that makes Christianity so offensive to many. You see, Jesus wasn't just a nice religious guy. 
He wasn't just a loving person. He wasn't just a good neighbor or a terrific teacher or a healer or a miracle worker. He was and is mighty God. And that means that we must humble ourselves before him and submit to him. His wisdom and his counsel must guide and govern our lives if we intend to follow him. Now, following him also means that because he is who he claims to be, because he is almighty God, he actually can save us. He actually can change us. He actually can do something about the mess of me and the mess of the world that I live in and contribute to. And that's exactly what Jesus came to do. That's what we followers are frankly staking our lives upon. That the one who came, the little baby who was lying there in a feed trough, because he is mighty God, one day he will bring with him his kingdom in all of its fullness, which means that perfect justice will be done. It means that truth will reign. It means that love and goodness and righteousness and kindness and gentleness, all of these things will reign supreme because he will reign supreme. All evil will be punished and wiped away. And that will be the glorious day, frankly, that all of our hearts, whether we even know it or not, this is what our hearts long for that day. Now, Isaiah doesn't stop there. He mentions two more names. The third one is Everlasting Father. He says, uh, friends, he says, every child in every family desperately needs the love of a father and mother. This is kind of a given. Moms and dads who make commitments to each other and to their children to love them, to protect them, to raise them, and then keep those commitments. That is what every child needs. Uh, psychologists tell us, sort of like they discovered this, chuckle, chuckle, but psychologists tell us that a child develops their early identity from the love and care of their parents. I read a report from a child development expert who said this, and I quote, it is unlikely that any child will ever reach adulthood healthy and whole unless some older person in his or her life demonstrates irrational and consistent love toward them. And that's probably true. But here's another truth. Not very many people get that. Some of us here didn't. I can't tell you the number of times that I have sat with both men and women and listened to awful stories of dads who got up and left or dads who were too busy or dads who were so broken themselves they didn't get the help that they needed. And so they ended up wounding their children and passing on their sin and moms too. The Bible says that every one of us is born with, in fact, a deep yearning for a dad, (laughs) especially a spiritual heavenly father who the Bible says made us in his image. I think another way to say that is to say that all of us long to be connected to and identified by our true heavenly spiritual father. A father whose unrelenting and consistent love would define us and help us understand who we really are, who we're really meant to be. It it is such a blessing to have a father and a mother who love us. One of the greatest blessings in life. But the fact of the matter is none of our earthly parents are capable of giving us what our hearts and our souls long for most deeply because they are like us, fallen, broken, imperfect, sinful. And they don't get it all right. If you've parented very long, you know that's true. You don't get it all right. The Bible says that the truth about you and the truth about me is that we have an everlasting father. A father with perfect love. A father with perfect wisdom and perfect goodness, perfect righteousness, perfect wisdom, perfect justice. And this father, get this, get this, wishes to be with us. All the time in this life and right on into eternity. And I'll tell you, we need Emmanuel, God with us, as desperately as I think we need air to breathe. And it's my joy to tell you, to remind you tonight that 
This God is here. He's with us. He's among us. He's available to you. That is why Jesus came. That's what Advent season is all about. Grace appearing. When Jesus appeared in that manger, he was a gift of grace. If you receive him, he'll be your wonderful counselor. He will be your mighty God. He will be your everlasting father. And one more thing, the last name Isaiah mentions, a prince of peace. Peace is not a terribly complicated concept. We talk about peace a lot, international peace, personal peace, peace of mind. But here's the thing. Without God in the equation, we have a heck of a time gaining any sense of peace in this world. On just about any level you can think of, whether it's personal peace, family peace, peace at work, peace inside a nation, international peace, there are typically lots of dissonance and hatred and discord and violence. You know, in the last century alone, some 90 million people died on battlefields. How do you think we'll do statistically in the century in front of us? Do you know there are over 20 million soldiers in the world? Why all these boots on the ground? Well, of course, to keep peace, right? Do you think the future looks peaceful in Ukraine or Taiwan or Russia or China or Iran or for the United States for that matter? You know, the amount of money being spent on weapons and soldiers and defense worldwide is staggering. It's almost $2 trillion a year. Can you imagine what we might solve, what problems we could address uh, if we turn that money into addressing things like malnutrition or starvation or education or housing? We'd probably come close to solving some of those problems. Why is it that no nation has been able to establish or sustain peace on earth? Not now, not ever. Closer to home, let me ask you this. Why is it that our marriages and our families and our businesses and our friendships, in this, all of these things, we spend such huge sums of money and vast amounts of time trying to settle conflicts? Do you know that there is one divorce approximately every 36 seconds in America? That's nearly 2,400 divorces a day, 16,800 divorces a week, 876,000 divorces a year. Why is it that peace eludes us even in the privacy of our own homes and our own hearts for that matter? Why is it that so many of us feel a low-grade restlessness or conflictedness most of the time? We've got a name for it. We call it stress. Why is it that pills and drugs and pot and other things that help us escape set record sales levels every single year? The Bible would answer those questions by saying that all of these things are just ancillary evidence of a much, much, much deeper problem. That all the dissonance and all the hatred, all the violence and all the conflict in the world is just outside evidence of the dissonance that's actually going on inside us, particularly, particularly as it relates to Almighty God. The Bible says that we're spiritually broken, we're disconnected from God, we're living in rebellion and sin, and we are now and always have been, so to speak, at war with God. And if you just think about it, you know, many of us, uh, either in the past, some maybe even here now, you know, we deny his existence. He's not real. Don't be concerned about him. Don't give him a, a minute's thought. Or we routinely ignore his, his goodness, his kindness, his gifts, the provision he makes for us, his truth, his justice. Frankly, we want his glory for us, for our glory. We want to be our own gods. And friends, truth be told, we are lousy at being gods. Really lousy. And that is why we are such a struggling mess sometimes. And that is why our world is such a struggling mess. That is why we need a prince of peace, someone to save us from ourselves, someone to save us from our sins, someone to save us from the brokenness in this world. And that is too exactly why Jesus came to earth. The Bible teaches that when you deliberately put your trust and your faith in Jesus, you are reconciled back to God in a miraculous, in fact, in an eternal way. Your unrighteousness is transferred to Jesus and his righteousness is given to you as a gift. Your sins are forgiven. 
And what is more, Jesus puts his spirit within your spirit. And his spirit is a spirit of reconciliation. It's the spirit that builds back the relationship we so desperately need with our everlasting father. It's the spirit we are told who becomes our counselor and he gives us wisdom and the ability to build bridges instead of walls with people. The spirit gives us the ability to forgive the way Jesus forgives us so that we can be engaged in loving relationships, even, even with people who disappoint us. The spirit gives us the desire for reconciliation with God, which leads to a pattern in our lives of something called repentance, calling my sin what it is and turning from it giving it to Jesus, being forgiven, receiving the power I need to change so that I can grow. That's what being a disciple of Jesus is all about, friends, growth. Now, I'm guessing that we have some dissonance weary people, maybe, among us right here, right now. People weary enough to say, you know what? I want to stop fighting God. I want to stop pushing him and others away. God, I want peace to reign in my heart. I need your peace. I want to be reconciled to you through the Prince of Peace, your son who you sent. I want to have the spirit of reconciliation at work in me. And if that's what you're thinking, well, friends, just know this. That is the work of Jesus' spirit in you right now. No wonder the angels at the first Christmas referred to Jesus as the Prince of Peace. You know, it was years ago now, but I remember it honestly like yesterday. Um, can't remember what I had for breakfast this morning, but I remember this. I remember, I remember an inner conflictedness and confusion in my life. A lostness, if you will, and a loneness, a brokenness in me that nothing I could do seemed to be able to fix. And I began to read a Bible that a friend of mine had given me. This was a friend that I had sold drugs with uh, on many occasions. And now he's handing me a Bible and he said, you need to read this. And I started reading. And I began to learn about something the Bible calls sin, which explained to me this brokenness that I knew existed in me. And I began to learn about Jesus being a wonderful counselor, about Jesus being mighty God and an everlasting father, a parent who cares and loves and is faithful, and Jesus being a prince of peace. And I decided to put my faith in him, and I began to follow him, and that was about 49 years ago. I know that shocks you. You had no idea I was that old. <laughs> and the first overwhelming sensation that flooded my life, friends, was peace. It was the end of a lot of internal conflictedness. I felt like I had, in fact, spiritually speaking, come home. I felt like I had discovered an identity that I was looking for and longing for. I felt like I had peace. I had an awareness of Jesus' love for me and the fact that he had paid a price for for my sins, and I came to understand that my sins were forgiven and my eternity was now secure, not because of something I did, but because of what Jesus did. And my present now had a purpose. And I'll tell you something, while I've, <laughs> I don't know what God's gonna do in my life tomorrow, but I, had, I can say that one consistent thing from beginning right to the present is purpose. Because what I do, I do with Jesus. And I wanted to honor him. And when it does it, remember that pattern I mentioned, repentance, confession, you know, I go there. But I'm telling you, friends, all of this that I'm talking about is available to each and every one of us. Why? Well, because grace appeared. That's why. And if you haven't, you just need to make the truth about Jesus your truth. You need by faith to say, I want you in my life, Jesus. And I confess my sin, I trust you to pay for them. And when you do that, Jesus will become exactly what the prophet promised he would be. For to us, a child is born and to us, a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And I wanna give you an opportunity to respond to these magnificent truths of Advent. And you can do that by praying a simple prayer. There's no magic to this prayer. It just expresses some of the kind of essential things that 
people pray and, and people say to God when they want to transition from being without God to doing life with God. You can pray a prayer like this with me right now. Would you, would you all bow with me? And if you're feeling God speaking to you and want to pray this prayer, then do so with me. God, I need you. I've been a self-seeking, self-serving person, and I have not acknowledged you or believed in you, let alone obeyed you, in spite of the fact that you are almighty God and you deserve my worship and my obedience. Please forgive me. And please receive me into your family. I deserve your judgment and punishment, but I ask for your grace and mercy. Jesus, please be my Savior and my Lord. Help me grow. Help me change. Help me live my life for you. Make this Christmas the beginning of a whole new direction in my life. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And I'll tell you, if you prayed that, there's two things. Number one, you got to tell somebody you really need to. Somebody you came with, somebody that you know who walks with Jesus, who attempts to. You need to tell somebody so that they can pray with you, for you, encourage you. And there's a second thing you need to do. You need a church. And uh, you may live here in this area uh, or you may not. If you don't, I'm sure there's a good church near you. But you need a church because you need other Christians who are equally as imperfect as you are. But they're trying to figure out what it looks like to walk with Jesus and to honor him and obey him. And what it looks like to love their neighbors. And that's why you need, you need a group of people. And that group of people following Jesus is called a church. You got a card when you came in. It's called Connect With Us 2022. And in there, it talks about Christianity Explored. If you're in this area and you're at all inclined to check out this church, this would be the thing for you, Christianity Explored. A little paragraph there tells you about it. It's an opportunity to ask questions. It's an opportunity to hear what the Bible says about Jesus. And this might be an important next step for you. If you already know Christ and you're looking for a church home, well, then you might want to come to something that we call Next Steps. And that's a class that's going to be uh, starting up in um, January. We would invite you to that. But take a look at this card. There's even a, in the middle there, Feed My Starving Children. There's something that we're all going to do as a church family uh, coming up here soon in the new year. And that's just uh, putting meals together and sending those meals off to children in other parts of the world who are malnourished and even starving. And by the way, we do something here at the church called the gift. It's a Christmas gift. We ask our people to give sacrificially to it. And uh, this year we had a goal uh, and, and th that gift, the Christmas gift is gonna be for Feed My Starving Children and also for a ministry that we support in Oxford, England that reaches students that are going to school there, shares the gospel with them, then disciples them. We had a goal of 45,000 uh, that we were asking people to just sacrificially give to, and we have already exceeded that goal. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you for getting on board. Thank you for caring for people that you don't even know. Thank you. Now, some of us here tonight, and I'm closing here, amen? Some of us here... Tonight used to be really close to God, but frankly, not so much the case now. Something happened in your life that disillusioned you or disappointed you or caused you to drift away. You got your eyes off of Jesus Christ and onto some Christian who was floundering and, and not flourishing and trying to follow Jesus. And uh, yet you're here today. And I would say to you, that's not a coincidence. And you've been thinking, you know, this is probably what I need. I, I need to get back to God. This is the direction that I, I need to go. I need a wise counselor, mighty God, everlasting father. I need a prince of peace. And this is the counsel that I want to build my life upon, Jesus Christ. Well, tell him that. Tell him that tonight. And purpose to walk with him and to listen to him and to obey him. Now, others here this evening have walked with Jesus for a long, long time now, and you're just kind of filled with joy because of the season, and you've got family with you, and that's a mixed blessing, is it not, amen? <laughs> you got family with you, and you're looking forward to celebrating, and Jesus has made all of that happen, and you just want to worship him. So let's do that right now. Let's worship him.